Hi everyone, it's Dr. A, and in this video, I'll provide an overview of our body's osteokinematic movements. Now, right before we get into the overview, keep in mind that osteokinematics are represented by what we can visibly see and the movement produced by our joints. Now, let's start by describing the osteokinematic movements that take place in the neck, or what we often refer to as the cervical area. In the first image on your left, we have cervical flexion that's taking place. We can describe cervical flexion as tilting your head downward or allowing your chin to touch your chest. Formally, any flexion movement involves a bending motion that decreases the angle of a given joint. Next is cervical extension, which can be described as tilting your head backward. And again, formally, any joint that produces extension involves the movement of one bone structure away from the other, increasing the angle of the joint. In the third image, we have cervical lateral flexion, and it's this movement that represents a side bending motion of the neck. For any movement that we come across that's described as lateral flexion, it's an indication that it's movement away from the midline of the body. And lastly, what's shown here is cervical rotation. This can be easily defined as turning your neck to either the left or right of your body. In fact, we'll normally see a directional qualifier added to this term. For example, if you're asked to turn to your right, we'd say that that movement is classified as cervical rotation to the right. Let's now look at the osteokinematic movements of the wrist. In our first picture to the left, we have wrist flexion taking place. If you will, try this movement on your own. To do so, place your hand directly in front of you with your palm facing upwards. Next, bend at the wrist so that your fingers are pointing back towards you. This is wrist flexion. Keep in mind that flexion involves a bending movement and it decreases the angle of a joint. Directly next to this image is wrist extension. And if you will, try this movement on your own too. This time, place your hand out directly in front of you with your palm facing downward. Now lift up at the wrist so that your fingers are pointing towards the ceiling. Again, that's wrist extension. In the third image, we have a movement referred to as ulnar deviation. For this particular motion, place your palm out in front of you, palm facing upwards. Now bend your wrist to the side so that it's moved in the direction of your pinky finger. What this showcases is a movement of your wrist towards the side of your arm in which the ulna, a bone in your forearm, is located. On the last image here, the movement is referred to as radial deviation. And as you may have guessed, it's movement of your wrist to the side, but this time towards your thumb, which is also in the direction of the radius bone in your forearm. Let's now take a look at the osteokinematic movements of your shoulder. First up is shoulder flexion. And from a seated position, it involves moving the arm, which technically occurs because of the shoulder, from the side of the body forward to the point in which it's parallel to the head. Next is shoulder extension. And from a seated position, this involves moving one's arm, again because of the shoulder, from the side of the body towards the back of the body and to the furthest point of extension all while keeping the torso straight and with the head pointing forward. Thirdly is shoulder abduction. Now at first glance, this movement may seem similar to shoulder flexion. However, there is a notable difference. While seated, shoulder abduction begins with the arm down towards the side and begins by gradually lifting the arm up and away from the body until it is parallel with the side of the head as shown. Fourthly is shoulder adduction. From a seated position, we can initiate shoulder adduction by beginning in a position of shoulder abduction. Adduction then involves gradually lowering the arm downward so that it's brought closer towards the body. Next up, we have shoulder external rotation, abbreviated here as ER. And the image directly to the right of it is shoulder internal rotation, abbreviated here as IR. To perform internal rotation, it's helpful to start in a position of external rotation, and then using your hand as a guide, turn your arm downward so that it ends up in an internally rotated position. In order to perform external rotation, it's helpful to start in an internally rotated position, 
and then rotating your arm upwards so that it ends up in the externally rotated position. Next are the osteokinematic movements of the elbow, which include elbow extension and elbow flexion. Perhaps the easiest way to describe this is by starting with elbow flexion. As shown in the image to the right, the elbow is bent fully with the forearm parallel to the trunk. To demonstrate elbow extension, one would move from a position of elbow flexion to lengthening the forearm so that it's positioned at the side, just as shown in the image to the left. Moving on to the osteokinematic movements of the forearm, we have two movements to consider. The first image shown on your left is forearm supination, and this movement is performed quite naturally by holding your arm out in front of you as shown, as though someone were handing you something. I personally like to remember it this way. Supination is the position in which you would hold a cup of soup in your hand. And directly to the right in our second picture is forearm pronation. And pronation is best demonstrated by moving from a position of supination and then turning or rotating the palm downward. Next are osteokinematic movements of the trunk. On the far left in our first picture, we have trunk rotation, which quite simply refers to twisting the trunk or torso to either the left or the right side, and the direction in which movement occurs is usually added on. For example, if you were to turn or rotate to your left side, we'd consider that to be rotation to the left. Next, and similar to what we've seen in the neck, is lateral flexion. The only difference here is that this side bending motion is occurring at the trunk. It too should have a qualifier attached to it, depending on which side the bending is occurring. In our third picture, we have trunk flexion, and this movement is also seen as the classic toe touch stretch. And last but not least is trunk extension, characterized by leaning backwards while maintaining an erect posture. Similar to the shoulder, the hip produces a large variety of movements. You'll also notice that the movements share the same description. First, we have hip flexion, which can be described here as movement of the hip upwards and toward the trunk. Comparatively, hip extension is movement of the hip away from the trunk in a posterior direction. Next is hip abduction, which is movement of the hip out and away from the midline of the body. The comparative movement here is hip adduction, and hip adduction involves movement of the hip from an abducted position so that it moves towards the midline of the body. Next is hip internal rotation, noted here as IR, and this one is unique. Let's take a look at this individual's right leg. Notice that the knee is turned inward, so what we need to note here is that the knee is in line with the hip, so as a result we have internal rotation of the hip. In taking a look at the image to the right of it, notice the right knee again. You'll notice this time that the knee is rotating outwardly, so we describe this as hip external rotation. Next, we have the osteokinematic movements of the knee. First, we have knee flexion. From the standing position, notice that we have a bending motion occurring at the knee. Directly next to this, on the image to the right, is an example of knee extension. To describe this movement, we can simply say that the knee has moved from a flexed position to a fully lengthened position, hence the name knee extension. Last but certainly not least are the osteokinematic movements of the ankle. First, we have a movement referred to as dorsiflexion. We can describe this as a lifting or pointing of the toes towards the body. This is also the same movement we would perform pulling our foot off of the gas pedal while driving. Next is plantar flexion. This is a pointing of the toes or ball of the foot in a downward position. This movement would represent you or I pressing down on the gas pedal to accelerate in a vehicle. Next is inversion. This is a rotation of the foot towards the midline of the body. And next to this is eversion, which is a rotation of the foot away from the body. Next, we have supination. And supination is unique given that it is a combination of movements. In particular, supination involves inversion, adduction, and plantar flexion. The next movement, 
Pronation is unique as well because it too is a combination of movements. It involves eversion, abduction, and dorsiflexion.